All right, folks, another edition here of Krantz's Corner, and I'm really, really excited about this because Gabby is back, one of the OGs here on Krantz's Corner. I've had him on since we basically started Krantz's Corner. Gabby Arudia from 247 Sports Coast to Through the Smoke podcast and Girl Dad Times 2 now as we've gone over all that before we started recording. First off, Gabby, welcome back to Krantz's Corner, and have you slept in the last couple weeks or no? (laughs) <laughs> sleep uh n- not quite not quite as much as i as i did previously but getting some you know she's definitely coming along so happy to be getting some the sleep that i am getting and i'm definitely happy to be you know back at work and you know doing all this type of stuff zach so i appreciate you you know bringing me back on oh, of course of course i'm gonna bother you all season long what are you kidding me all right <laughs> let's get into this just catch me up because obviously gabby is the one that i watch for everything when it comes to recruiting buzz and the news and when it's actual happening and not just rumors out there i like to see gabby stuff there uh pringle fitzgerald i saw names all over the place what's the latest on everything going on or what's going on in coral gables university of miami yeah, you know, uh, you know, recruiting wise, yeah, you know, Miami, uh, you know, over the past week have let, have added two more pieces to their uh, 2025 recruiting class. That's the current cycle coming up. So the group that's going to be signing in December, uh, they flipped a uh, defensive lineman uh, from NC State out of Newberry, Florida, kind of the, the Gainesville-ish area, uh, Micah Newton. So he's a guy who has a bit of versatility to play outside or on the inside. I think Miami plans to develop him as a defensive tackle. Uh, six foot three, 260 pound range. I think his motor is probably his uh, superpower. You know, uh, just a guy that can kind of go uh, get north and south. And I think what he can potentially do from the interior if Miami develops him there, I think they're really excited about that. Uh, a guy that won't, and this is actually kind of a trend with some of the dudes that Miami's been adding recently, just turned 17 this summer. So despite him going into his senior year, he, he's just now turned. 17 so won't turn 18 until he's until this time next year when he would have already spent you know five six months in miami's uh, strength and conditioning program and all those types of things so miami's really excited about that addition uh you know again getting him from nc state zach i mean i know you watch enough college football to know that nc state does an excellent job of uh stashing and developing those uh defensive linemen so that's a big win for miami on the recruiting trail uh fitzgerald you know who you mentioned bryce fitzgerald out of miami columbus uh tight recruitment you know florida state was a perceived leader for quite some time uh you know, throughout the summer, he was kind of always talking about Florida State, LSU, Florida. Miami was kind of always like the outside school. Like he was never really talking about Miami as like the school. Uh, you know, at one point, again, it felt like Florida. At one point, it felt like Florida State. Going right. into commitment week, uh, a lot of the buzz was on Florida State. But Miami, again, uh, ultimately gets Bryce Fitzgerald to stay home. And look, you know, we, I mean, again, I don't think I have to tell you, Zach, those Columbus ties run extremely deep Huge, uh, you right. know, between Coral Gables and Miami. I mean, that's Mario Cristobal's alma mater. That's Alex Mirabal's alma mater. And uh, plenty of o- other uh, big time supporters of the University of Miami are Columbus alums. I mean, that's one of the um, let me tell you, I was at that school on Thursday. Uh, there is not a better facility like football facility, sports facility in Dade County than at Columbus. It, it's it's absolutely ridiculous, all the things that they have over there. So, um, again, uh, Bryce Fitzgerald, a, a really good player. He had 10 interceptions as a junior, uh, as a sophomore at, at Belen Jesuit, crosstown rival. Picked off five passes, also helped the team win their first ever basketball state title as a sophomore. So he gets it done on the hardwood. Uh, you know, he's he's ball hawking, you know, secondary. He could play, you know, kind of like high high safety and, and be sort of that ball hawk back there. Uh, he could play some cornerback. He has a verified 4 4 8 40-yard dash time to his name. So, uh, again, I think this is just another big piece of a, of a really important secondary class. Miami really needed to right. attack the secondary this recruiting cycle. And Bryce Fitzgerald uh, gives Miami five blue chip uh, defensive backs in this 2025 class. It ranks top 10 nationally. So, uh, once again, Mario Cristobal and these guys doing an excellent job on the recruiting trail. Bryce Fitzgerald, one of the biggest uh, additions uh, who kind of, you know, just recently jumped on board. Yeah, you mentioned Gerard Pringle, uh, got a, a, Miami's running back commit. Again, blue chip guy, number eight running back in the country for us at 24-7 Sports. He came, him and, uh, and Armwood out of the Tampa area came down to Traz Powell to play Miami New Orleans, who's considered one of the top teams in Dade County. They they, they walked out of there with a 51-20 to 20 win over Ooh. New Orleans. And uh, Pringle had a lot to say about that, had two touchdowns, had about a 75-80 yard touchdown down run that kind of broke the game open uh took a long took a screen a long way in the in the first half so uh Gerard Pringle uh, Miami's tailback a little bit different you know we're talking about Damian Martinez and Mark Fletcher and Jordan Lyle kind of six foot uh 511 200 plus pound backs or you know in that range Gerard Pringle probably more of like that five nine and a half five ten range probably in that 180 pounds but he's electric he's that guy kind of like a, a one cut back you kind of get him that hole and uh once he kind of hits his top speed it's going to be tough to catch him so uh, a lot to be excited about uh you know watching miami's top running back commit uh perform at a high level here in dade county 
God, can they get, can Mario get three straight years of unbelievable classes yeah. at this point? I mean, obviously that's what he's known for. We've, we, where, right. Whether he's went, he's done it, but doing it here in, in, in Dade County in Broward County in South Florida, it just hits a little bit different, right? It just hits a little bit different when you start hitting oh, yeah. all the top players from down here or a lot of them. You're never going to get all of them, but a right. lot of the top players, because we've had that discussion a million times. Any Cans fan that thinks that every top player in South Florida is going to the University of Miami, it's not happening. But if you can get a good percentage of them, absolutely, you can have that top 10 class nationally very quickly, like uh, Gabby just said at that point. Okay. We actually have some Canes football here in the next two weeks, which is unbelievable. Wait. We're here, Gabby. We have we made, made it, it past the summer. <laughs> you have had another kid. We have made it to football That's season. Right. A lot has happened in the last couple of months, uh, but we're getting there. I know we don't see a lot in practice. Obviously, when you do, you get to see about three minutes worth, and then you get to talk to the players afterwards. That's it. They do a, they do a good job down there of not letting anything be seen, right. and that's fine. What are you hearing? Because me and you have had discussions on O-line, D-line since Mario's got here yeah. about how good or how deep they are now. I went to media day. I saw the guys again, uh, and I saw the the uh, the amount of big dudes that are out there. Right. But big dudes are big dudes are one thing. That's fine. Can they play football or not? But what are you hearing O-line and D-line wise for this team coming up? Yeah, you know, I think the way Mario Cristobal's built this roster, I mean, trenches is is going to be the identity, right? Like, I think that offensive line and talk about recruiting classes. I think that was the first thing that Mario Cristobal targeted was we need to get this, we need to get these the this off offensive line bigger. And I think really for the first time, uh, you know, in the, I mean, maybe not the first. I think last year's offensive line was obviously really good, but I right. feel like the first five was really good, and they didn't have to dip into the depth, which is. Probably an outlier, you know, just not having to like having five healthy starters, you know, start to finish is rare. And, you know, those guys play, play, played banged up, but that's, you know, another thing. I think for the first time, truly, Miami's probably eight or nine deep on that offensive line where if they really had to dip into it, I think they'd feel pretty comfortable about what's behind it. Uh, those guys are ultra competitive. You got three starters returning, you know, Jalen Rivers, uh, you know, second year left tackle. I think he's going to be one of the best in the conference. I think he has a chance to get drafted, uh, you know, this you know what you know in the you know the 2025 NFL draft you got Francis Mauanoa coming back at right tackle and Ez Cooper who I think is one of I think one of the most underrated offensive linemen in the conference I think you know he's gonna I think he's in line for a huge year now in his third year with the program and his second year as a full-time starter uh you know again I, I think the offensive line is awesome and you know with Zach Carpenter kind of coming at and at center it seems like Matthew McCoy uh, is probably in line to be that left guard. I think that was like the open spot that we didn't really know who was, who it was right. going to go to. I think they're still competing, but I'd see, I, I think Matthew McCoy, I think there's a good chance that he kind of gets the nod there. And then again, that depth. I mean, Ryan Rodriguez, another kid from Columbus, is someone that's really come along. He's doing an excellent job. you got Samson Akinlola, who's still kind of, you know, who's working, competing, but still has, uh, you know, some ways to go in, in his second year. Tommy Kinsler is a massive body. Markel Bell, the junior college transfer, who's six foot nine, who makes Bryant McKinney look a little small small, uh, which no one really can say that, right. but I think Markel Bell can. Um, so, you know, I think this offensive line has been as good as Miami could sort of expect it to be at this point, especially from a depth standpoint. And that defensive line, man, that defensive line is salty. You know, I, I think those guys, when when they're going, uh, you know, it, it's it's tough to stop. There's just so many ways that they can kind of attack you. You know, you got Ruben Bain, of course. Everyone's talking about the defensive ends. Ruben Bain, uh, Aki Mesador, who getting incredible feedback on Aki Mesador at defensive That's end, good. just as far as, like, if he's healthy, he could truly be one of the most disruptive players in the ACC type. Like, not just, oh, he's a really good player. Like, no, he could potentially be the best player on our defense if he's fully healthy like that's what that's the Akeem Mesador vibes that we're kind of getting right now plus Tyler Barron who looks you know like a potential you know day one day two pick when it all kind of clicks for him just given his his measurables the size of six foot four 260 plus pounds like he 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 when it, when it all kind of when he when he just puts together those um you know, just what he does best. I mean, it looks it looks as good as you could ask of it. Right. Amari, uh, Elijah Alston as well, kind of that speed rusher off the edge. And then you can kind of kick those guys around, like Ruben Bain can kick inside, Akeem Mesidor can kick inside with those two edge guys. And then plus the defensive tackle depth is much better with Simeon Barrow, CJ Clark. Uh, you got a guy like Marley Cook, uh, you know, Ahmad Moten, Justin Scott, the five-star true freshman who's coming in and, and, and able to, you know, potentially contribute as a day one guy. I mean, I think Miami is really, really strong on both sides of that. Long, like that line of scrimmage, Zach, and as we both know in this sport, that's where it's won, at, at least at a high level. You need to be able to win in the trenches. You need to be able to stop the run. You need to be able to protect it up for your quarterback, create those running lanes for your running back. And I, again, I think Miami's going to be really, really good in both those areas. Ruben Bain on media day. I just asked him one question about uh, 
what it's like every day in practice. And he said it was almost like the old school saying, but it was close where he didn't want to come out and say practice is harder than the games. But right. he said, he goes, you don't realize what every day we go through uh, when we're fighting against that offensive line and how good they are and how good we are. And I love to yeah. hear that. I know guys want to pump themselves up. That's fine. But when a guy like Ruben Bain says that and a guy who the transformation, by the way, that we've seen on his oh, body yeah. and he's put it on on social media and we've seen what it's looked like from the day he walked in to what it looks like now. It is ridiculous the way this kid, this is the true kid that you need whenever you have a recruit come on campus. Ruben Bain should have a conversation with them at oh, this yeah. point, the legacy and what he's done so far. It is fun seeing that in the O line and D line. I know that we've talked about a lot over the last year and change here. Okay. Cam Ward. Preseason all ACC, preseason yeah. this, preseason that, all yeah. American, every he's got the accolades or preseason accolades that every quarterback and every team wants their guy to have. Right. Is a lot of pressure to be putting on him because he is coming in here as like the hero quarterback yeah. guy for this team that hasn't been here in a while. Is it too much or do you think he'll be able to handle it? Yeah, I, I think that's going to be a big question with Cam, right? I, I think it's just – and look, I think you go back to his days in Incarnate Word, his days at Washington State. He kind of had to be – he kind of had to throw his cape on and kind of be the superhero, right? right? Like he needs to be the guy that made every play. Like He doesn't need to be all that here, right? Like, you know, like he he's obviously an extremely talented player, but, you know, I don't know if he's going to throw for almost 4,000 yards, you know, right. I, and I don't think he needs to. So I think, uh, you know, I think the biggest thing with Cam is just going to be just tr kind of trust what's around you. Like your, your head – is probably not going to be spinning in the ways that it was, you know, in other, at these other places. And you're, and he's able to do it. He's able to kind of create for himself and escape these kind of situations where he can play that superhero ball if he needs to. But I think for Cam, it's just going to be about, you know, kind of staying within this offense. This, this offense is built for him. It's built to emphasize his strengths. Uh, it has a really strong running game, which opens, as we know, Zach opens up those, the, those passing lanes. He has the, he has the weapons at wide receiver. He has the weapons at tight end. He has the weapon at running back and he has a really good offensive line like he doesn't need to be you know the you know the, he needs he just needs to kind of you know stay within this offense and just right. kind of go and if he does that he's gonna have an extraordinary year and all those accolades will come along with it as long as he just kind of stays within that so uh you know again i, I don't know about pressure i'm not i don't want to speak for cam as far as just like what he's thinking or anything like that but from what i gather he's just a total kind of alpha who who gets it? I think Miami does a really good job of, of keeping, uh, you know, everything kind of inside the program as far as like not letting too much get, uh, you know, inside these players, you know, in, in front of their eyes or let them kind of, you know, believe all these things that they're kind of seeing about right. themselves. And I, they're about, the, I think they're about to work over there. I think Cam has a lot that he wants to prove, uh, you know, to the NFL guys. I think he has aspirations of playing on Sunday. And again, I think Miami is the spot where he has the potential to you know, really elevate his stock. And again, I think it just starts with just, you know, just doing your job. And we talked about that with players all over the team. If Cam Ward just does what he's asked to do, and he right. just kind of stays within himself. I think he's going to have an excellent year again, just because of the pieces and the supporting cast around him are, are there to help him accomplish everything he has to do. So I'm not super worried about, I mean, you can't control all the preseason hype, right? Course, all the preseason right. expectations, but I think Cam's going to handle it well. And again, I think Miami's put him in a position where he's going to succeed, which is probably why everyone has these expectations for him, because I think they know if this is who, if this is who we know him to be, right. and this is what he has now. I mean, I think, I mean, I, I think it could be a really, really special year for Cam Ward, but I also think it could be a really special year for some of the other players, like the you know the running back room and you know et cetera. I think uh, again, this offense in general is is pretty lethal. It, it, let me tell you, this is probably one of the most fun, at least on paper, offenses I've seen in like 15 years at the University oh, yeah. of Miami. Because top to bottom, because some years you'll have a great running back room, but the wide receivers are okay. Some years the offensive line's a little bit better, but the running back room's not so great. I like all the rooms right now. I like the O-line room. I like the yeah. wide receiver room. I like the tight end room. I like the running back room. And obviously when you have Cam Ward there, that helps out a lot. This offense should be 10 times better, I think, than last year. And... To a point, I'm not saying that last year was bad. I'm saying that this right, year was more consistent. Right. I just right. think it's going to be so much more consistent because you're going to have that Cam Ward type there or Martinez when it's yeah. at third and three and you need to run the ball instead of right. throw it for a first down. I think it's going to be a lot different. And, and of course, my man crush, since, since he's gotten to campus, Mark Fletcher, when he gets healthy again. I mean, the first, I told you, I, I tell the story every time I talk to you and every time I talk about that media days. First time I saw Mark Fletcher, I asked him what he was doing at the offensive players because he looked like a linebacker, <laughs> and I was wrong. It was Mark Fletcher at that point. I couldn't believe it after seeing him at American Heritage, too, play football. All right. Um, 
we talked about this a lot over the last kind of season and a half too, uh, and especially after the season ended. The the secondary cornerback safety is you lose two starters. Obviously, that's not easy. What are you hearing there also? Because I know that might be might have been. I don't want to say now, but might have been one of the areas of big concern after last season going into this one. But what are you hearing there? Cornerback safety is the whole deal back there. Yeah, yeah, I think it's fair to kind of if there, if there's a question mark on this team, I definitely think it's a secondary. Uh, you know, they got a couple returning starters in or Daryl Porter, Damari Brown is a part time right. starter. He's kicking into that nickel role, so he's playing on the inside, kind of learning a new position as a, a kind of bigger, you know, cornerback who has the ability to kind of help in the run game as well. So I think I'm curious to see how that transition for Damari Brown at nickel kind of goes. They Mish Powell, the Washington transfer, was playing that in the spring. They kicked him back to safety full time, so you get some veteran, uh, you know. Know, leadership on that back end alongside Jaden Harris, who's a first time starter, uh, you know, outside outside corner opposite of Daryl Porter, you got uh, Jadis Richard. But actually, I think there's a true freshman in OJ Frederick out of St. Thomas Aquinas who people are ultra high on. And uh, I think that he has a chance to potentially emerge as uh, one of these standout defensive true freshmen who kind of gets on the field sooner than we anticipated, not because he has to, but because he's earned it, you know, because right. of the performance that he's had that he's put together since he really arrived this summer. You know, not an early enrollee, not a January guy got to campus this summer and has just continued to impress, has kind of like, you know, the prototypical corner frame as a guy that's, you know, over six foot. He's long. He can run. He can catch all those types of things. And then he's just been ultra competitive in camp. And, you know, but the buzz around him is that he's just constantly making plays on the ball. So uh, OJ Frederic is a young freshman. I would watch at corner to see if he kind of steps up. That's not ideal. You know, again, right. I think you can be encouraged that there's a freshman that's emerging while also recognizing it's probably not best case scenario area for you to have to potentially rely on a freshman and I'm, and I'm not saying that they will have to but um you know again I think that that's where uh you that's just where we are in the secondary right now and you know we talk we talked about Bryce Fitzgerald earlier in the show like Miami is hitting uh the defensive backs class extremely extremely right. hard in this 20 foot 25 class to build that necessary depth back there and again they have a lot of versatile uh, talented pieces coming in, but they're not here now. They can't help you yet. But I think that's probably the area on the roster where Miami uh, probably didn't do what they felt like they probably had to do, uh, whether that be, uh, you know, maybe even in the portal as far as get going right. out and getting exactly what they needed um, and, you know, et cetera, maybe high school recruiting in, in the past. So uh, that's definitely probably the biggest question mark. And I'm not saying they're bad. I don't think I'm not saying the secondary is bad or that it's a weakness. I just think that's probably the spot on the field where we're just like, Let's kind of see where we're at there. And again, I think it helps when you have a crazy D line who can kind of right. make the quarterback, uh, you know, or, or just generate a ton of pressure on the quarterback. But they're going to have to make plays. I'm sure defenses are going to try, offense are going to try to spread them out and eliminate that pass rush, especially Florida, who does a lot of that quick dick and dunk game with uh, Grant Mertz. Uh, those guys are going to have to be ready to make plays and tackle. Yep. All right. Speaking of that, let's get to that before we get you out of here. We, like I said, two weeks away, less than two weeks away from Miami going up to Gainesville in the swamp and playing a very important game for both programs yeah. at this point. A, what do you like? What do you not like going into this game for UM? And the buzz during, before, and after this game when it comes to recruitment, how important is this for both teams to get that win or at least not put a bad showing in front of kids that might be watching this? Yeah, yeah, I'll start with the I'll start with the recruiting part, the back end of that question. I mean, I think it's huge for Miami to go into the swamp and and win that game. Uh obviously Florida uh is a school that still recruits at a high level. I mean, it's a, it's a major brand not only in college football but especially here in the state of Florida where right. you got where Miami's battling the same for the same kids that Florida like the same kids Florida wants or the same kids Miami wants. <laughs> uh, there's definitely a couple kids on Florida's commit list that Miami wishes were on, that w wishes was on their commit list that they're still going to continue to work on. So uh, Miami going up to the swamp and handling business from a recruiting standpoint is huge, you know, kind of just continuing to show that Miami's a school that's trending up and Florida's maybe the school that's trending down. And we just talked about this game just as far as importance, as far as what it means for both these schools. I mean, for Miami, uh, you know, I like where Miami's roster is at. You know, I can't I, I like where I like this team. I'm confident in this team that's going up into the swamp. I think one thing ab about just Miami as a program historically, uh, you know, obviously I think it's gonna be a super competitive game. You right. know, I I don't think that that, you know, people are talking about Florida and this insane schedule and Florida's going to win four games. Like maybe all of that could be true, but this is week one and right. none of that matters. You know, this we're going to see the best version of the Florida Gators that, uh, you know, anyone's going to see this year, you know, as far again, regardless of where things are in November, that doesn't matter in August. So, um, you know, it's going to be an ultra competitive game. 
but you know, I think Miami needs to show that they can go into an SEC environment and win these types of games. You know, they went into Texas A&M a couple years ago, seemed sort of rattled. Uh, you know, I felt like they had a chance to win that game, but just it felt like that environment was just a little bit too much. And then I think historically, Miami just hasn't had a ton of success winning these big games in road environments. So I think, oh, you know, I think getting over that hump, it's going to be wild in the swamp, Zach. I don't have to tell you as a you're a Gator alum, right? right. You went to you. Florida, you, I'm sure you've watched a number of games at Ben Hill Griffin, and uh, that is one of the that's one of the most ruckus scenes in college football. So Miami is going to have to show that they can win a, a major game on the road against an in-state rival. I mean, I think that's just the reality of it. Um, but I think if Miami just handles their business, I think if Miami plays their best football, I think I, I envision uh, them coming out of the swamp victorious, and and that would be big for obviously for Mario Cristobal for a number of reasons. Uh, I think it would be obviously bad for Florida for obvious reasons, just considering the gauntlet that they have to kind of go through. But this is a huge game. Man, and it's August. You know, the, regardless of the result, I think, I think the, I think the result will be exaggerated one way or another. I think right. if Miami wins, it's gonna be oh, Miami's this and that and that. It's like okay, maybe, but maybe not. Like there's still a lot of road left to go. And if Miami loses, it's gonna be oh, this and that. And again, maybe, but maybe not. There's still a lot of uh, still a lot of football left to be played. So, um, I, I'm I'm just curious to see how Miami shows up. You know, I think that's probably the most important thing to me. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. It's gonna be nuts. It's gonna be ninety thousand plus. It's oh, a yeah. great test for for UM to go up there, especially yeah. with this new team, new quarterback, everything. And for Florida, like you said, every the, the gauntlet starts this week or next right. week. It's it, it literally starts for them, but it's no excuse. And Billy Napier knows that also. Whether he wins four games, five games, or ten games, no one's going to care unless they win. Like it's right. it doesn't matter to any Gator alum out there. But what a test for this UM team because it is going to be nuts in Gainesville oh, yeah. for that entire weekend from Wednesday until su early Sunday morning when it finally yeah. kind of hits. It's going to be nuts up there. Gabby, great to have you back. Great to great to hear everything is good with the family. You know, that's first yeah. and foremost on my list with you always is. And I'm happy that, to hear that. Happy you're getting a couple naps in there. You're not going to sleep a lot, but you already know that. So go enjoy <laughs> right. working a little bit as you can. And uh, welcome back to Krantz's Corner for the football Thank you, season. Man. Thank you so much, Zach. We'll chat soon, man. Absolutely. I'll, you know, I'm going to hit you up and bother Absolutely. you a lot. That's Gabby Rudio, one of the OGs here for Krantz's Corner, 247 Sports and Through the Smoke podcast, which I'm sure he's taping today. So go check that out as well. It's been a good, good, fun special edition of Krantz's Corner here with my man, Gabby Rudio. <laughs>